next oldest type of subsistence strategy is pastoralism. And here we're talking about domestic animals and their byproducts. So foraging is a food collecting strategy. Everything else we're going to talk about, including pastoralism, is a food production strategy. We still see a high degree of mobility among pastoralists, and that's because they have to move their herds around to wherever there are resources. Some of the most common animals that we're going to see is here are sheep, but goats, camels, cattle, horses, donkeys. Some of the least common are yama or llama, yak, and reindeer. Uh, kind of like foragers, pastoralists are being pushed into marginal habitats, so having a hard time surviving because they're having a hard time finding p pasture for their animals. Um, I do want you to keep in mind that this is not ranching. Uh, pastoralists produce for more than just meat and milk, and they are they move their animals to pasture. They never bring fodder to the animals. Um, and again, quite extensive land use. <coughs> we have a gender division of labor. Usually we're going to see males working with the larger animals and women working with maybe like sheep and goats, so much smaller animals. Property, they do not own land, but the animals are owned by individuals, so that's where their sense of property comes into play. We see semi-permanent camps, so you might have all the women and the children and elders and any sheep and goats at a permanent, semi-permanent camp while all of the younger men are out with the larger herds. Again, high degree of sustainability. If pastoralists have enough land, they can survive for very, very long periods of time. This particular kind of subsistence strategy emerged about 12,000 years ago. So it again, it's a long-lasting uh, strategy. What's kind of interesting with pastoralists, we often see large extended families. And again, that has to do with taking care of all the animals. We're going to use the areal of Kenya as our example. And the areal are becoming pretty well adapted to marginal environments in Kenya, so the slopes of the mountains where soil's not that thick, and also into uh, some plains areas. Um, they're successful because they exploit a highly diversified system of animal husbandry. Now what this means is that they have herd diversity and they keep their animals pretty mobile. So the Ariel actually herd cattle, camels, sheep, and goats. They split their herds up and they might take some cattle and some camel and put them in one area and then they'll take some more cattle and camel and put them in another area and so forth so that their animals in case of disease or drought, not all of them are going to be are going to die. So it's a really good sustainable strategy. And now the herds they also use to convert lands into seasonal vegetation and of stuff that they like to eat. So it's really kind of interesting that they're using their cattle can or excuse me, cattle in multiple ways. They do use their herds for food. Primarily the sheep and goats are for meat. Um, they also trade those animals for goods that they don't produce themselves. They use the milk of camels. And for the zebu cattle, they use those primarily for exchange. And here I'm not talking about trade, but it's exchange with other Ariel groups or other family groups. And they use them primarily for bride price, which is again something we're going to talk about later in the quarter. But in this case, a bride's family gets eight cattle in exchange for a daughter. So this distributes wealth because everybody's wealth is in their cattle. And it helps to maintain herd diversity. So those genes are constantly getting mixed up. And that's really important because in modern societies or industrial agriculture, intensive agriculture, where we still have animal husbandry, but all that diversity be, is being bred out because people want to be able to kind of calculate what the yield is going to be, but unfortunately that's reducing genetic variability. So if a disease would come through, you know, many, many, many animals might be wiped out or entire herds. So all of the variability in domestic animals is being kept by pastoralists, so it's really important that we don't let pastoralists become extinct. 
Um, the Arya also consume the blood of animals. They actually don't kill the animal, they just let blood. So they might, will collect some blood, um, and they only have to do, you know, an animal every few weeks or so. Uh, it's a renewable resource, because you can get four liters out of one animal every three to four weeks. Um, they often mix the blood with milk. Uh, warriors among the Ariel are the only ones allowed to drink pure blood. It's a great strategy. I know it sounds kind of gross to us because it's not a part of our normal existence, but blood is highly nutritious. So it's very low energy expenditure for nutritional return. Uh, kin relations here were patrilineal, and pastoralism is the birthplace of patrilineal societies. And what that means is that kinship, inheritance, is all reckoned through the father's line. This probably came about because of male upper body strength. So a lot of pastoralists living in rough territories, if you have to haul a cow or a camel or a donkey or try to haul some sheep up a mountainside, upper body strength is really going to be a benefit. So we think that's where patrilineal societies really started to emerge. The REL use age sets, and this is how they maintain social cohesion, because if you've got a bunch of people out looking for herds, and then you've got these semi-permanent camps, you've got people spread all over the place, and that's a difficult thing to maintain. So here, again, using age set sets, generally in about a 14-year range. So when a group of boys all get around the same age, they will start training them to be warriors. They go out, they stay with one of the herds, they do not have any interaction with females whatsoever. Um, males go through stages where they're boys, they're warriors, and then they're elders. Females go through girl, adolescent, and kind of married stage. Um, each age set has specific clothes, diet, socializing rules, duties, so you can often tell where somebody is in their life just based on what they're wearing and what their hair looks like. So if we use warriors for example, they're initiated into warrior status as a group. Um, everybody is circumcised at the same time and they get a group name. Then they grow their hair into long plates which they dye red. They can't eat food that's seen by women and again they can't even have any kind of interaction with women whatsoever. And this is another really good strategy because while you still need a pretty big group to be able to take care of all the animals, it can't be too big. So separating boys and girls during that adolescence period where hormones are kind of out of control is a form of population control. So that's the Ariel and our pastoralists.